want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, we're thrilled to have you and really appreciate the time that uh, Efficiency Maine has uh, provided today with their team to um, review and go over the, the recent plan developed, three-year plan developed. And uh, we have the opportunity for you to ask questions along the way. There is a Q&A box. Chat is to the general population, but Q&A is to the moderators and the speakers. And we will be watching that Q&A window for questions you may have as we go along. Feel free to enter them as we go. And then during um, breaks along the way, we'll be uh, happy, to, um, happy to look at those and, and get the questions asked. Um, Maine BPA is a recent affiliate of uh, the Building Performance Association's national organization. And we're thrilled to have uh, a group organized in that state. This is run by volunteers. And this is an organization that really works on stakeholder engagement and helps to coordinate uh, the activities within the state around the energy efficiency retrofit market. Uh, we're thrilled to have the volunteers. I know uh, uh, Richard Burbank has been taking the lead on that along with Suzanne, and we're uh, very appreciative of their efforts on our behalf. So we look forward to hearing uh, what you all have to say. I'll start off by passing it over to Michael Stoddard, who is the Executive Director of Efficiency Maine. And uh, Michael, appreciate you and your team being here today. And uh, uh, I welcome you and pass this along to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I welcome you as well, because I think this is the first time uh, we've uh, had the pleasure of you and your team joining us here in Maine. Uh, some of the folks who are attendees, we, we work with on a weekly basis, but it's great to have you all joining us as well. And uh, we're excited to be expanding the universe of folks who are, uh, we're collaborating with for our programs and the really important work that your members do in this state. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce our team here for those who may not know. Uh, who are, or maybe are just listening on phone and not on video. And then I'll uh, quickly introduce what the agenda is that we have. And we, we created a little, uh, little slide deck to summarize what we have put in the plan and what the latest status of that is uh, to provide a little background. And then we wanna provide as much time as possible to go through some of the questions that Christy passed along to us and that other folks may have that, that uh, come to mind. So we'll, uh, save as much time as we can for that and try to move expeditiously through the, the introductions. Uh, so to start it off, um, I'm Michael Stoddard, the executive director, as you mentioned. I'm joined on uh, the call today by Peter Eglinton, who is the deputy director of Efficiency Maine, and Andy Myers, who is the uh, program manager, the senior program manager for the Home Energy Savings Program, and Bridget Gifford, who is the uh, program manager for the low income initiatives, uh, including some of the weatherization measures that we do through that initiative. So you've got the four of us here. Um, we know pretty much what there is to know about our programs, maybe not everything. And we are really looking forward to um, continuing this, this discussion that we've uh, had with you over the past decade, uh, sometimes uh, fast and furious and other times in a lull, but um, every three years we have a strategic planning process that comes along and when we when that when that happens we have a nice opportunity to take a step back and take a look at all of the programs we run and, and reconsider whether we've designed them in the optimal way and how much budgets we have available and uh, and it's a great time to talk with the practitioners in the field such as yourselves to have that conversation and uh, see how we can continuously improve our programs and, and uh, not only to help you grow your businesses, but also to deliver the benefits of energy efficiency to the constituents uh, and the customers of Maine. So, um, so we are grateful to have had the conversations we have over the last several weeks as we've been uh, pulling our planning process uh, across the finish line with our board. And then uh, something that we want to be really clear with you, we envision as being an ongoing discussion. It's not something that just uh, happens for a month and then it's over. It should be continuous throughout the every year and all three years of the, of the triennial plan. Um, so 
Bridget, can you bring up on the screen the uh, PowerPoint slides we made? And it's got a quick, uh, it's got a little agenda there. So I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, I, I can see the screen fine. If others cannot see it or if they're having troubles, please put a note in the chat um, or in the Q&A and we'll try to address that. Um, so I just want to, I want to go into a quick summary of what's in the plan, a description of what we have in terms of budget and the program designs, most of which you all are familiar with, very familiar with, and we probably don't need to spend too, too much time on it. Um, although the budgets are new and that's pretty important and that's gonna allow us to do some new things. So we wanna make sure we touch on that. But uh, generally speaking, you all are experts in what's in the program designs. So, I, I, and I don't think we're envisioning something radically different. So uh, you should feel quite familiar with everything that you see here, uh, but it's worth recapping it. Uh, but just also wanna start at the beginning of uh, what some of our motivations were as we developed the triennial plan as it pertains to weatherization, because that's really what the topic of this discussion is, is weatherization. So I'll start with the policy drivers that were pushing on us and how we framed the triennial plan with regard to weatherization. We'll then touch on the budgets that we have for residential weatherization programs. And we'll talk about those two basic programs. One is the low income initiatives where we're doing weatherization for low income customers. And then the other is the home energy savings program, which we sometimes referred to as non-low income or market rate programs. And then uh, we'll, we'll run through the questions um, and some of them have already been submitted. And then if there are others, we'll tackle those when they come up. So let's proceed. Um, so the key drivers for us on weatherization uh, most recently have come from the state's climate council plan that was developed over the course of the past year and a half. Um, I think some of you were involved in those discussions. I, as you may know, served as the co-chair on the buildings working group that was responsible for managing discussions and developing recommendations to the Maine Climate Council about uh, buildings, including things like weatherization. And out of that discussion and ultimate the recommendations that were put into the plan was a goal of doubling the rate of weatherization projects in Maine over this decade. And the ballpark estimation of what that would accomplish would be to add 35,000 new weatherization projects in the state from 2021 to 2030, of which 10,000 would be in low income homes. And that goal is not uh, just specific to Efficiency Maine, it would be to Efficiency Maine and any other entities that were involved in doing weatherization, uh, not, not only private sector uh, weatherizations that might receive no uh, program support, but also any other programs such as those run by Maine Housing and the CAPS, for example. Um, after that Maine Climate Council plan was submitted, uh, the legislature got busy and they proposed an, uh, a, a variety of bills, one of which was introduced by Representative Kessler, which was LD 385 and was passed. Not all of them were passed, but this one was. And it took those targets that were in the plan, the Maine Climate Council's plan regarding weatherization, and it put those into the part of the statute that directs Efficiency Maine, what it needs to pursue in its triennial plan. So that was passed. And so those targets of 35,000 homes and businesses to be weatherized, at, of which 10,000 shall be for low income homes, at least 10,000, um, that is now in the statutory goals that we have as an organization to try and pursue, uh, obviously, you know, funding permitting. Uh, so some years we don't have enough funding to get anywhere close to that, but um, 
but some years we we should. And so now we at least know what our what our goals are with regard to weatherization. Um, and another piece that I just uh, wanted to note that was in that bill that passed was an expansion of efficiency mains authorization to help uh, establish training programs. We have a fair amount of language in our statute, in the statute that authorizes us uh, to do training, but it was largely focused on energy auditors and solar uh, from, from about a decade ago. That seemed like an important thing, but more recently we've found a need to expand that kind of training. And so we uh, worked with Representative Kessler to get that authority expanded. Anyway, uh, onward. So the triennial plan process took uh, us the better part of nine months to get to this point. And that started with a series of board meetings and workshops, which were open to the public. We had uh, multiple rounds of written comments that we solicited and received and digested and tried to fold into our plan, which came out to be about 120 pages of program descriptions and another couple hundred pages of appendices with supporting documents and calculations and analysis and so forth. Um, and then we did also have a public hearing which uh, Richard was at and represented you all very ably, I might add. Um, and um, then that resulted in a final, final plan that was uh, presented to the Efficiency Main Trust Board uh, last, is it last week, uh, whatever, uh, Friday, the, uh, I'm sorry, Thursday, uh, September 30th, and was unanimously adopted by that board um, with a few little tweaks made here and there to the language, uh, either corrections or a few other things, which uh, we'll talk about in one second. Um, so our plan from here is that over the next couple of months, we will file this plan with the Public Utilities Commission. They will open a docket, which will be open to anyone in the public and any interested party to, to chime in if they wanna say, they love it or they hate it or they think it should be changed or whatever else. Um, and they will issue an opinion um, after a couple of months and the, that opinion or that order will do two things. It will number one, determine what the final content of the plan is and will reflect, reflect any changes that have been made through the process. And it will order the utilities to um, begin collecting uh, payments that will be remitted to Efficiency Maine for the portions of our work that are uh, to save electricity or to save natural gas. And, and that, so they order the utilities to pay us the funds for that. Um, the funds, a lot of the funds that we use for weatherization don't come from electricity rate payers or from natural gas utility rate payers. They come from, as you know, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, REGI, or federal grants, or um, other settlement funds that we have that we're allowed to use to save uh, on what we call unregulated fuels, which is things like heating oil and propane and biomass. So that's what we use to fund most of our weatherization programs. So they'll give that their stamp of approval and we'll be off and running. Um, but it's not the end of it because it, because there's never a total, there's never a complete end to it. So it is an iterative plan and it gets updated periodically as uh, circumstances dictate. At, at a minimum, we file an update annually uh, on March 1st of every year. But there are also occasions where something major happens. It may be budgetary. It may be some change in the marketplace that's sort of drastic and we have to make a mid-course correction. I just wanted to convey to you that we have the ability to do that. Once we get a three-year plan approved, it's not carved in stone. Uh, it's, it's a pretty solid foundation and we try not to change it very much over the course of those three years, but we can if we have to, if it seems like there's a really compelling reason. So. Um, and when, when that happens, if it's a big change, it requires approvals the same way as the training plan itself required approvals. All right, let's go on to the next one. So as I mentioned, at the time that we asked the board to approve this version of this final version of the plan, which was on September 30th, we also asked them to make some 
changes, some corrections, uh, and some alterations based on some discussions we had, including with Richard and including from some communications from your organization. And uh, chief among them is, this, is the second thing you see here on the screen um, at page 65, workforce capacity. Um, we had a sentence in there that, um, that we had added uh, in, a, in a prior draft to try and indicate that we were interested in exploring a variety of ways to help help meet this new target of doubling because we're not exactly sure we don't we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know exactly what combination of uh, approaches and and rebates and marketing and workforce training is going to help us reach that goal so we'd like to keep our options open and and see how it goes and um, we understood, we heard you and we understood that this caused a fair amount of consternation. And so we uh, offered to strike that sentence. And with that amendment, the board did uh, accept that and uh, approve the, the final version of the plan. Um, there were similar little tweaks made in the low income initiatives with regard to a couple of things, but not that particular sentence, but the um, to, to reflect that some a, a fair amount of new federal funds is being directed to these purposes and, and some of it may be used for innovative financing, uh, such as through the Green Bank um, that was established in legislation this, this past session. Um, and so you see that referenced in a couple places here. So those are the two um, last minute edits that were made at the table by the board uh, and that that uh, plan will now at some point soon be filed with the Public Utilities Commission. All right, let's go to the next one. And so I think this may be my last point, which is the, the resulting budgets that we have now for both the low income initiatives and the home energy savings program are very, very, very significantly increased from prior years. So you'll see um, a, a, the low income initiatives has been a, just a tiny fraction of this. And this is the uh, portion of the $25 million from the federal uh, ARPA, the American Recovery Plan, Act, uh, Rescue Plan Act um, that has been allocated to Efficiency Maine uh, for weatherization, uh, primarily for low income. And so we've put our chips there from those federal funds and we spread it out over four years. So it's important to understand we're not proposing and we are not budgeting to spend all $25 million in one year. We're, we're trying to ramp it up gradually over a period of four years. Um, and we think that this will be a stretch, this will be a hard goal to meet, but this is a more realistic and reasonable expectation for the marketplace to grow into meeting this level of demand. For the home energy savings program, that the weatherization um, is, is the, the budgets we have there are going up to 4.3 million in this current year that we're in right now that we just, we started back in July and then increasing up to 5.7 million in FY23 starting next July, and then increasing again up to $6.6 .6 million the following July, and then finally in the fourth year, $7.7 .7 million. So again, it's a, it's a very significant increase, but we're trying to do it at a gradual rate so that, um, so that you all and the customers can sort of keep up with it and we're not, uh, over committing. So, um, yeah, the, the one thing to note is that that um, home energy savings program budget does include, uh, there are some other measures besides what we would consider pure, you know, weatherization in terms of air sealing and insulation. And at, that also would be eligible for use uh, by pellet boilers and, um, and stoves. 
and geothermal systems. The truth is we just don't see very many of those. So almost the entirety of these budgets has been going to what I would call traditional weatherization. Um, but it's, it depends on what customers are interested in doing. So that budget does have to accommodate those other measures, but almost all of it has been going to weatherization. So you're, you're talking about total budget increases of uh, going from 8.3 million this current fiscal year up to 17.4 million in the fourth year. And I should, if, it's, if you're wondering why we're showing four years, the triennial plan that we just submitted covers these last three columns, these last three years. It co covers FY 23, 24, and 25. But we thought it would be useful for you to see the current year that we're in, which is also an increase from prior years. So we are already starting this, this ramp up um, with, with significant increases in funding. So now I think I may be done. Yes. So I can now hand it over to uh, Bridget and Andy to give a quick recap of what's in their programs and what we're thinking we will do with these funds. Thank you, Michael. So this slide is just outlining low income initiatives. These are the measures that are not utility funded. So um, this is ARPA, this is um, the NECC fund and REGI. Um, weatherization, heat pump water heaters, uh, heat pumps, and um, some affordable housing projects and other. This is sort of our, our research around um, building envelope and heating system upgrades that is looking at some mobile home applications there. Um, and the learnings from, from our innovation program feed into other programs. So we're really looking um, for some learnings around those applications. Um, and then some financing options for qualifying uh, low-income customers. So um, essentially what we're talking about right now is weatherization and the ARPA funding that is coming our way. Um, what we are doing already is using the Reggie money so that um, you know, we are starting our ramp up for low-income weatherization. Um, we are We've got some goals in place that um, are pretty pretty strong, and um, we have been budgeting to a much smaller. Uh, we've been setting goals to a much smaller budget in years past. So, uh, really, what we are what we've done so far is uh, we've aligned our claim forms so that more low income families are even aware that there is an enhancement for low income, um, and trying to let vendors know that this also is an option for uh, low-income homeowners. We have increased the rebate amounts quite a bit. Um, we have taken the zone out of the um, requirement and just we're looking at whole house. Um, so these are a few of the things that we've done so far. Historically in low-income, we have not really marketed much. Um, it's tough to market to the low income homeowner. So what we've done in the past is just, uh, you know, we've used our collaborations with main housing and, and they share a list with us about everyone in main housing who is eligible for their heating assistance programs. And we, we direct mail to those households and we let them know all of the offers that efficiency main has for them. And so what we plan to do this year is um, a lot more marketing. And you know, you'll be hearing about weatherization, hopefully everywhere you turn, um, on the radio, in print. Um, and so the Home Energy Savings Program and the Low Income Initiatives is, is trying to align on that and sort of get the biggest bang for our buck with marketing um, and just really trying to shout from the rooftop so that everyone is aware of the offers through Efficiency Maine. Um, so those are some of the things that um, you know, we've done so far to, to ramp up. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Andy. Um, I think Andy and I are on the same page where we feel like, you know, it is our, it is our job to make the phones ring. So um, just talking about the, this workforce capacity issue at the bottom here, um, 
you know, the more efficiency mean can grow the existing businesses. Um, the more we can make those phones ring, the more business coming to you, then um, hopefully the market can respond. Andy, I'm going to advance. Thank you. I'm ready. Okay. Um, okay. So all of you are familiar with the Home Energy Savings Program, um, and you know we're at this is the non-low income program. Um, the uh, Michael already mentioned the Reggie dollars that we use for Home Energy Savings Program, which I'm going to call HESP, um, is primarily for weatherization, insulation, air sealing. But it's worth noting that we will also use the funds for geothermal systems, pellet boilers. This, we've been doing this for years. Um, we may use a million dollars a year to recapitalize the loan pool um, with the popularity of the Home Energy Savings Program in the last few years. We're lending up more and more of the money that we uh, have in our revolving loan pool. So we want to make sure that we don't run out of that. Um, and then if allocating additional funding is warranted, we may use that for retrofit heat pumps. But really, when we say Reggie, we're mostly talking about weatherization. Um, the goals for HESP are not nearly as aggressive for low income. It's more like 20% per year growth, which we're in funding, which we're delighted to have. Um, the funding has been fairly flat for a while. Um, and so what we're going to do is look for five ways of driving demand. Um, you are the ones who do all the work, but we try and help by driving demand. Um, one thing here on the, the first one here, increased flexibility of how to apply rebates. Um, we've already taken some steps um, within the month to try and make a home energy savings program simpler and uh, easier for you to use in more cases. So instead of $1,000 per zone, we're now saying uh, up to $3,000 per home. You can use all $3,000 in the attic if you want, all in the basement, whatever mix you think is going to help the homeowner. Um, so simplifying the program. Is, is one thing step we can take and we have taken. Um, a lot of these things are just tools we have. So I don't want to confuse people with plans versus tools. We'll, we'll respond as with, with these uh, potential approaches based on uh, success and, and demand. Um, the next is to increase rebate amounts. We may increase rebates, we might not. Again, it depends on what demand is. It's one of the five tools we have. Um, financing is something we may expand, we may improve the offerings, if, see if that helps. Again, all these are balancing acts. Um, marketing is, Bridget just mentioned, we've kicked off an, uh, the biggest marketing push we've had in many years. Um, we're pretty excited about what that can do. Uh, we, and we will continue to adjust marketing based on demand. You, you can see what our budgets are and our goal is to invest that all cost effectively. Um, and supporting uh, registered vendors is a, the fourth tool use, very critical. And you've hopefully already seen some support. We're in the process of hiring a person uh, dedicated to uh, proactively reaching out to um, all registered vendors, but especially the top performers and making sure we're all the resources that we have available for you, you're aware of and are using as much as you want. So that will become more proactive. Um, and lastly, not listed here is what you've always seen us do, which is continuous improvement. So we spend time uh, traveling in the field with registered vendors. Um, a lot of you on the phone, we spent time with um, we, we're having the proactive calling, asking for feedback. Um, as Michael said, this is not um, a three year plan carved in stone, this is a framework every three years, but we were continuously tweaking it. We'll probably launch a change every month, all year long on one program or another. Um, so you folks play a critical role in helping us uh, decide what tweaks to make. Is it richer incentives or, or maybe reducing incentives? Is it more marketing or less marketing? Um, what are we doing for financing? What support do you need? So that, that, that fifth uh, component is very, very important, continuous improvement. And you folks, um, and you'll be hearing, you do hear regularly from Adam Gifford, we're asking for your feedback before we make decisions. So we appreciate you guys have always been terrific allies in helping us make sure we're making good decisions. Um, and so those are the five way, five approaches we look at to either accelerate or decelerate demand based on our budget. And that's it for that slide. Okay. 
Um, so these are the questions that Efficiency Maine received. Um, and I think this first here, I'll just go through them all. I think some, most are low income related, so I can speak to most. And I think uh, one or two here for Andy and Michael. But um, the first one, the overview of the triennial plan for HESP and low income initiatives with goals and budgets broken down. Um, I feel like we have just addressed that one. Um, so I will just move along to the second. Um, please describe how the 25 million in ARPA funds will be used for weatherization within this plan. Um, all of the 25 million uh, ARPA funds will be used for insulation and air sealing is the plan right now. We will accelerate as the market uh, you know, can bear. Um, that's, we are right now trying to ramp up, you know, we have gone from a budget of about 330,000, um, to, for fiscal year 22, we're looking at around 3 million. So, uh, we need to certainly accelerate low income weatherization. Um, and right now we are doing that through our increased rebates, our simple, simplified structure, a very heavy marketing push, um, and we're just going to have an iterative process for, you know, just folding in strategies as, as needed. Um, yes, Michael wanted to add something. Yeah, I just want to chime in that um, as folks may know, we have not actually received the federal funds yet. So we're in a little bit of a holding pattern until we do. Um, we're lucky that we have some Reggie funds that we can budget here so that we can kind of get started. And, but we're not, um, we're not, we haven't hit takeoff yet because the funds um, have not been formally approved and, and, and transmitted to us. So there's some bureaucratic steps that are gonna have to happen. And I'm not exactly sure when that's going to happen. I, I think it'll be before um, before the end of the calendar year. But uh, in any case, I don't imagine that things are gonna ramp up so fast that we can't cover increased activity um, with the Reggie dollars we have right now. But just so people know, it's not in our bank account yet. So we're, we're taking all uh, steps we can to prepare for that. Thanks, Michael. The next question, number three is for you around workforce development. Um, the initial question was a little longer, I condensed it here, but essentially there, um, the question is, what degree of flexibility does Efficiency Maine have to provide capacity building support and funding if gaps in state and other program, sorry, I can't see that, <laughs> uh, emerges? Could Efficiency Maine use its expertise in public outreach and marketing to do a recruitment campaign for workers to enter this field of weatherization? Yeah. So. I think the short answer is we have a lot of flexibility. We have a lot of flexibility, but I think the key question is uh, is identified by the by the in the question about if there isn't uh, sufficient, you know, if there are gaps in the other state programs to do this. And so we're in a little bit of a wait and see mode because, as I think I mentioned to Richard. There is more than $250 million that was, that was allocated in the governor's plan and approved by the legislature for workforce development, specifically $250 million. So, you know, that's 10 times the amount that we're going to spend or try to spend just on the low income insulating and air sealing. So imagine 10 times that amount just for workforce development, and they have it broken out into about a half a dozen different initiatives, including apprenticeships, financing for small businesses that want to expand so they can bring on more, more staff, uh, more, more workers, um, uh, training, um, the community colleges and the C CTEs are all getting uh, more significantly more funding so they can invest in equipment. Um, you know, I think advice and counseling on how to do these things, and they all have this workforce development um, theme to them. So we thought the smart thing to do would be to 
work with them as they de design their programs. And we would be happy to work with you all to go arm in arm to them and say, hey, this is what this sector of the economy really needs help with. Um, because I think we should try to tap those dollars before we tap into the much smaller pot of money that we have to help subsidize these individual projects. Uh, so that was our thought is that we would work with you and others to recommend to, to participate in the development of those different plans, those different programs that are mostly going to be run by the Department of Labor and the DECD, the Department of Economic and Community Development, work with them, talk to the governor's office and others. They're very, very focused on how they can do more for recruitment and for training and for apprenticeships. They're very focused on it. But you, I think we would all agree, those guys are a little bit more the pros in this area than we are. And so we wanna help you carry the message to them so that hopefully those $250 million get put to good use. Uh, and if there are gaps, then yes, we do have the flexibility. We can help fill in some of those gaps um, with the funds that we have and the authority that we have. But we think that we're in a very special moment here where uh, the state of Maine has never been better funded to do that out of some other sources. Uh, thanks, Michael. So uh, question number four is essentially asking, is this weatherization plan a signal to HESP vendors to shift focus and expand to fill the gap in low income programs? Um, and I would say that the weatherization vendors are all independent contractors. There is a lot of work to be done in HESP. There's a there's a big budget there, and there's a lot of be work work to be done uh, for low income families. Um, and there's a large budget there. So, I I would say that we we are just trying to invest funds in weatherization accordingly. We're trying to get to the thirty five thousand uh, homes, um, and we need all of the vendors to certainly, um, you know, do the HESP work and, and do the low income work. Um, so people are free to put their focus wherever they see fit. Um, there are more questions on the next page. So I'm going to advance unless anyone wanted to pipe in. Okay, the question number five, with 25 million of ARPA funds being directed to low income, weatherization and last fiscal year results of 185 completed building envelope measures, how does efficiency mean plan to achieve a six fold increase in activity when compared to the current pace? Um, again, this is over many, many years and this is an iter iterative process. We will do all we can do. We're going to um, market as much as possible. Um, we also are leaning on uh, the um, main housing to add their weatherization assistance projects into the count. Um, and we are right now, you know, as Michael stated, we don't have the funds in house yet. So we are just in a ramp up um, phase and we're going to constantly be checking in with you and with each other about what strategies we, we may need to employ. Um, number six, I'll scoot to number six. The question here um, is around competitive solicitations. Um, since the language remains on the low income side. What does that mean for low income? Um, is this anything like what has happened in other states? Mass save where program implementers um, does all of the energy audits and subcontractors work with the vendors. Um, I think the competitive solicitation language still exists as just sort of like a back pocket plan. Um, if in year three, we have a remaining budget not invested, not committed, uh, we would look toward our local vendors first to um, potentially, you know, employ that kind of strategy of competitive solicitation. Um, I think that's the, the thinking behind the language is, you know, all strategies are on the table to, to get our um, you know, low-income homes weatherized. And so if down the road we can't get there and we've got a large balance, then what can we do? 
Yeah, I, I, I talked with Richard about this a bit before the training plan vote that happened. And um, I mean, I think the first thing I can say is we were not envisioning an approach like mass saves. That was not what we had in mind when we used the words competitive solicitations. I mean, the first thing you should know is we use competitive solicitations all the time. Uh, it's a standard tool for procurement for government agencies. And so um, we, that by itself is, a, is just a generic term. We've used it to some advantage, as you may know, some of you, um, for getting delivery teams, getting firms like yourselves um, and, and getting them volume, um, volumes of customers, you know, big chunks of customers all at once instead of um, uh, just one at a time. And if in the case of low income and particularly where we may be drawing from a list of eligible customers, we uh, might find that we could do that more efficiently for you by uh, if we if we had an approach like we've used for the installation of heat pump water heaters for low income we've done the direct install and people tell us what their rates would be and that they're willing to play by the program rules and we say great we'll start feeding you these 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 projects as soon as we can clear their eligibility and validate that we'll send them your way uh, and you tell us what price you'll you'll give. So that's one form of competitive solicitation. Another one we've done with the small business program where the same thing, we used, we've kept it open to multiple contractors, contractors from all over the state. You know, will you give us a, a, a bit of a better rate for some kind of a volume discount? And I think Keith has done this. I, I think others have done this in uh, um, Weather Eyes, um, um, we, I think Freeport had a weatherized Freeport. There's one that's happening in Portland now. Uh, there was one in Rockland, I believe, uh, a few years ago. So those those were the kinds of things we were thinking. And it's, what Bridget is saying is we're just trying to indicate that we're open to creative new approaches to try and uh, increase the volume of project work. And so that was really all we meant by it. Um, I, I'm we're not going to ever say that we won't use competitive solicitation because we use it all the time. We have to, in some cases we're required to, uh, but we were not envisioning anything that looks like mass save. Thanks, Michael. Uh, question number seven. This question is around property values. Um, we use assessed values to um, verify eligibility for low income. So around the property values, the rural areas and, and real estate markets, have been heating up. Uh, are there options for alternate means testing to enable um, an increase in low-income weatherization goals? So uh, we recently did take a look at the assessed value table and uh, made some changes to that and increased some of the more affluent coastal areas. Um, so we are unlikely to make any changes to the assessed value table at present. But we have for years been talking with the Department of Health and Human Services to trying to coordinate in a similar way with DHHS that we do with main housing. So main housing shares their lists and we have access to you know, about 40,000 low-income Mainers. Um, DHHS has a list of about 180,000 low-income Mainers. And if we could um, see who they are, we can um, you know, very easily target those households and, and have a, a clear way of verification, um, that could be another eligibility into the weatherization program. So um, we're not there yet with DHHS. Uh, we are closer than we've ever been. Uh, that's something that we hope to see soon. Um, in the meantime, it was, it was brought up, one of the vendors had a suggestion that we partner with different municipalities and an outreach to those properties within the municipality that do fall within the threshold um, that is the maximum value and, and they would be eligible for the low income offering of $9,000 or 90% of the project cost up to $9,000 for weatherization. And so we've begun to do that. It was an excellent idea. Um, we've been chatting with Bangor. They've sent us a spreadsheet and um, we're in the midst of creating a direct mail to, to those um, properties within the 
Bangor city limits that um, are within the 90,000 threshold. And so um, we'd like to do more of that. Again, we want to get the phones ringing. And so however efficiency mean can assist in those hot leads, uh, that's what we're interested in doing. Um, and then question eight, unless anyone wants to add color to my answer on seven. Um, question eight is, uh, I think, to Andy or to Michael, to Andy. I'll take it. I'll okay. take that. Yeah, the question is how do program delivery costs work in HESP and low income weatherization? And almost all our programs work the same way. Every three years, we go out to bid nationally uh, to companies that administer weatherization programs, whatever the program is, and we award uh, the contract to administer our program to whoever the best bidders are. So it's a national solicitation. And in the past, uh, actually since HES started, it has been CSG and then Clear Result who bought CSG, um, but we go out every three years and that's how we know that we're get the very best value for ratepayer dollar. Um, so that's, and that works the same way on low income weatherization. So that's how that works. Um, I do, um, sorry, go ahead, Michael, yep. So that is how that works. Um, I think is, I think folks may have had the impression by calculating what we ended up budgeting for that there was some assumption that they're like those delivery teams receive a commission or that they would get paid an amount a percentage for every project that was done based on the, the, the cost of the project. And that is not what happens. That is not what happens. We, what we did is we reversed out and said, well, last year for all of the budget that we spent and all the work that was done and all the hours that they logged and billed us for, what percentage of the total program cost did it end up costing us? And that's where these numbers came from. So uh, when we were budgeting for the training plan, we said, well, we better budget enough money to cover our delivery costs, which could be, it could, it could and it does include marketing. It includes all the um, inspections we do. It, inc it includes all the reporting we have to do, all the data storage and we have to do and analysis. All that stuff gets rolled in there and that's about what it comes out to but it's not a compensation scheme, which is the way the question sort of reads to me as you, you, you thought maybe a project that was worth $1,000 would get a 20% commission and a project that's worth $3,000 would get a 20% commission, even though they're the same size project. That is not what happens. Just want to assure you of that. Uh, thank you, yeah, Rich. Uh, Michael, I, I missed a few points I, I was supposed to cover. It also covers rebate processing and the on-site QA inspections. Uh, marketing's one of the biggest uh, line items. Um, the uh, the registered vendor support when you folks call in, the team that answers your questions, and loan processing as well. All those things are done on a time and material basis, so it's a billable hour rate. So if we double our incentive from $1,000 to $2,000, they don't get paid any more for that. It's just the amount of time it takes them to process that rebate, and we pay it. And it, on the marketing, um, if it's a $10,000 advertisement run in a newspaper. They pass that on to us, we pay $10,000. It doesn't double if the rebates double. Thank you, Michael, I had missed some points there. Um, I, I think that might be our last slide, guys. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm sure there are other questions. So, I, well, I see that um, Chris Kessler has asked a question. So maybe, do you want me to start with that, Christy? or I don't know who's running the, who's driving the bus here, but- um, Yes, Chris, so you want to build the questions. You can see them as well as I can in the Q&A and, and that's fine if you wanna just go ahead and answer that. Yeah, so I'm happy to take a shot at a couple of these. Um, I'll start with the one that Chris asks about eligibility for low income customers, um, where we know that main housing data shows that there's about 30,000 households. It's actually up to about 40,000 now that are eligible for LIHEAP, only a third actually receive it. Um, I'm, I'm not in a, I don't think that's quite correct. Um, so the first thing is that um, there's closer to 40,000 homes and they're not just eligible for LIHEAP, that is LIHEAP. 
the number of households that are eligible for LIHEAP is probably, I think that's maybe what you mean, Chris, is that there's three times as many households that could get LIHEAP if they signed up for it, but they don't. I think that's what you mean, but I'm not positive by the way your question is framed. Um, everyone that signs up for LIHEAP gets something if they, if they get accepted to LIHEAP in terms of fuel assistance, but a lot of them get only a nominal amount. And for those folks, it's not because Maine Housing doesn't like them, it's because their income is relatively high and they're signing up for LIHEAP, not so much because they want the fuel assistance, but because it gets them eligible for other services. At least that's my understanding. I mean, obviously Efficiency Maine is not the authority on what Maine Housing's programs are doing. Um, it would be better to ask Maine Housing directly, but I think what you mean, Chris, is what about all the other, you know, let's say it's, let's say it's triple the amount of homes that, that uh, the households that are actually would be income eligible for assistance. And to that point, uh, this goes back a little bit to what Bridget was talking about before. We're trying to do a couple of things. Number one, we're trying to get a bigger list, bigger than just the, the LIHEAP list, because we all know that the LIHEAP list is a pain in the butt to sign up for and get screened for. And we also know that DHHS has a list of means tested households that is more than, more than triple, it's more than quadruple the number of households. So that leads us to believe in terms of households that are low income in Maine, there's probably closer to 100 or 150,000 of those. So I think your question is how are we planning to get to more of them? And the first easiest thing we could do would be to break this log jam that we have with DHHS who informs us as they have for five years now that that information is confidential and they can't give it to us. Uh, but we've had a little bit of a breakthrough as Bridget said, the first part of the breakthrough is that one of the exceptions for DHHS to share confidential information with a sister agency such as us is if we are engaged in the activity of delivering federal funds for a, a, a program uh, that is supportive of federal programs. Well, this new ARPA funds, the 25 million is federal funds. So for the first time in many years now, we're going to be able to check that box and say, we think we are now eligible for this exception. Will you please share the confidential data with us? We don't want all of it. We don't want to know their income. We don't want to know what reasons they're on a DHHS list. We just want their name and address. And if we have that, we can accomplish two things. Number one, we could potentially reach out to them and market to them and let them know they would be eligible for these programs. And number two, if you bring them to us or they call us directly, we can look it up and say, good news, you are eligible for this special treatment. You are eligible for this special rates and we would be happy to make that happen. And you know, so, whether it, so it could really become a useful two-way street for us and really expedite uh, and smooth out that process. But the other thing we've done, as you can see, is we, we came up with this, I think, fairly creative uh, way to validate uh, something about their status by using the property assessed values. And uh, that, that is at least some um, independent authoritative source that we can point to, to show that something about their relative um, income or wealth status. And so, uh, we think now, as, as Bridget was saying, that by us being more, the, the biggest problem we had for all these years was we just didn't have enough money to, to really open up the doors because we were, had such limited funding and we know that there's so many homes, we couldn't possibly accommodate them all if they all came rushing through the door and said, yes, I'm ready to sign up and do this. Uh, and so we didn't advertise um, and we didn't have a good way to, to validate their eligibility. Um, and uh, we think now that we have this significant um, federal funding, we will be able to accommodate for the next several years, as many as could come through the door that you, that you would have the capacity to serve, uh, even as you grow, hopefully, uh, over these next few years. So 
that's generally, I guess, my answer to that is that we think that we can be more proactive now in reaching out to them and explaining and marketing to them um, and, and, and collaborating with you to get that message out to them that they are eligible for some very generous deals. Um, and then one last little piece that we're researching now but haven't exactly nailed down is whether the establishment of this new green bank authority, the clean energy accelerator, which is being, uh, which is authority that's been given to Efficiency Maine, is something that we could use to even further um, open access for these lower, uh, low and moderate income Mainers. Um, I don't know if I should just read these aloud. So Chris asks again, what is the vision for weatherization funding and market influence beyond 2025? I don't, I don't have one. Um, we're in pretty good shape with Reggie dollars right now. And so I think for the market-based programs, um, which is HASP, that um, there should be a real, um, there should be a, a, a solid opportunity if that continues. But I, I, I wouldn't suggest for a minute that that those Reggie revenues are predictable that many years out into the future. So if it keeps going the way it is, we could be fine. But it's um, that's feels like a million years from now. So I know Chris, in your line of work, uh, especially with uh, work at the legislature it's really important to be thinking out that far ahead. And I'm really glad that you're doing that, but we should keep talking about that. I don't have a great answer, I'm afraid. Um, I think I'm at Keith's question. Keith McPherson has a long question about um, the discrepancy between funds available Michael, while you're reading that, I'll, I'll give you a chance to read and jump back to early question. Someone asked, an anonymous person asked, is there intention to significantly increase rebate amounts for wood stoves? And uh, the answer is no, we don't offer rebates for wood stoves. Thanks. I think what Keith's question is going is the, like just the challenges of competing for, 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 for workforce um, with the with the wages that you're able to pay. Uh, I mean, that's a gross uh, simplification of what Keith has spelled out here. Um, how can our organization help use our contacts and relationships to help small business contractors be able to meet our demand of work? Um, so, I mean, to be quite candid, Keith, you're asking a quasi-state agency to do something that is not something we've done in the past. And I, I'm not convinced that it's something we would be particularly the, the, the ideal. Um, I mean, I hear you saying we need, it sounds like you're saying you could, you would appreciate some help and we're happy to help in the ways that we have competence to help in, but I'm not exactly sure that we're best suited to do some of the things that you're asking about. And I, kind of was thinking that as to my earlier response about the workforce development um, uh, funding that is coming from the American Rescue Plan and going to the Department of Labor and the Maine Technology Institute and the DECD, it feels to me like what you're describing is exactly what they are expecting to use those funds for. And their funds is 10 times more than the funds that we have to help run these programs. So I feel like, and maybe you guys can point out to me how I'm missing this, but if I feel like our best plan would be to work together to put proposals in front of them and say, hey, you guys got all this money now, we need this kind of help. You know, Can you use some of that money to help us do these things? Uh, so I think it's great that you're, you're specifying what the problem is and that will make a much more compelling case if you can articulate what the, pro the nature of the problem and the size of it. And then I think we complement that with some suggested remedies to the problem and, and put it in front of them. And we'll work with you to do that. Um, that feels to me like that would be the most fruitful way because I think they're better set up to do it. 
and Michael, that yes. a, a key part of what BPA is doing, uh, both in the state of Maine and nationally, is working on building capacity for the workforce. Um, a, a lot of our efforts right now are in developing the programs that work state by state, and that will implement. You know, we we have been um, we introduced Hope for Homes uh, over two years ago. And it's now down into, um, you know, final reconciliation, which uh, to say final and reconciliation, same sentence, a little difficult sometimes. But, um, but as we look at that, you know, the hope portion of Hope for Homes is workforce development, the energy efficiency retrofit industry. And uh, we believe that it's essential to us in starting these affiliate networks out at the state level. Uh, is to ramp up and be prepared to have a mechanism in place that drives workforce development. So uh, please be watching for the things that we have in there. But uh, you're right, Michael, it is, it is important for us to serve our industry in that area uh, so that you, you all can reach your goals by us having uh, people in place. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I imagine it's small consolation, but everything we're hearing anecdotally is that you all are not alone in this in this struggle uh, it seems like so many sectors are really wrestling with this so it's a it's a big problem across the entire state i mean bath ironworks is advertised my brother lives in ohio my brother called me a couple weekends ago and said i just heard an ad on the radio in my hometown of ohio for bath ironworks so it's, I mean, they got a lot of money. They can go advertise all over the country, I guess. But that was impressive to me and tells me that this issue is just a really a big challenge all across the state. Are there additional questions that we had out there? Um, I see that uh, Beverly Fournier has um, put forward her her point, her observation about the way we're doing the uh, property assessed value to establish eligibility for low and moderate income homes and, and finding cases where the value of the land is putting the total over the, the threshold. And so those folks are not eligible. And um, the issue for us, Beverly, is that we do not have a good way to determine what the county median value is for the house only. We need some way to show that the relative value of this household compared to all the other ones in the county is in the lower, in the lower portion. So I don't doubt that some of the folks you're looking at uh, or talking to may actually be in that, but we do not have a way to independently validate that relative to the other folks in that community, that they are at that lower end of the scale. And that's because the counties only publish a value of the combined value of the house and the land. So that's all we have to go from. And I wish it was better. I wish there was another way to, you know, I wish there was some way we could split it out and then know what the median value is, but we're not gonna look up the property value of every single home in every single county and do that calculation ourselves of what the median, uh, the median property value is. So we need something that's publicly available that we can look up and we need a, a countywide median total that we can compare it to so that we can, so that we can do this. So right now we're kind of stuck with that, but I, I'm really hopeful as Bridget was saying that we might have um, an inside line here on a whole bunch of new um, lists that will help us establish eligibility. And so maybe that problem will become a problem of the past uh, fairly soon. And we'll have a new way to open up uh, and establish uh, eligibility. And then, then we won't have to worry about that anymore. So that's my hope. Uh, but I hope you understand that that's what uh, we're struggling with in that case. Uh, Jim Beaulieu asks, would we consider an incentive to trade in polluting and inefficient wood stoves for low emission models similar to the past program by the American Lung Association? Uh, Andy, you want to try that one or do you want me to tackle it? Um, I'll take a shot and you can clean up. Um, we, <laughs> we would be focused on efficiency, Jim, if we did. 
um, as opposed to uh, pollutants. And we have we did run a program uh, that was focused on efficiency, um, and we used the EPA numbers for efficiency, and we're not as confident as we'd like to be on the um, accuracy of their efficiency numbers. So right now we're not, but I would say generically speaking, efficiency is what we do. Michael, how would you? Yeah, this is, um, wood stoves is a really tricky issue for a couple of reasons. One Andy just mentioned, which is their methods of standard, their methods of certifying their levels of efficiency, of quantifying and certifying their efficiency levels and their emissions levels have been lousy and nobody believes them. And so we didn't really have a good basis to say why one was better than the other and that we should pay money for one uh, compared to the other. So we got a lot of complaints from manufacturers and other people saying that it was just kind of silly and didn't have any, any real rational basis. Um, but the other bigger challenge that we're starting to get to now is that the legislation that established the Maine Climate Council and established the carbon reduction targets that we are all talking about as driving this whole discussion, not the whole discussion, but a big piece of it, and driving these targets for weatherization and driving this funding, um, also said that the carbon targets were to be met using gross emission reductions, not net emission reductions. And I, I will leave it to Chris Kessler, your, uh, your favorite state representative who can maybe expand on the pros and cons of that. But I can tell you what it means is that technically a wood stove is not um, emissions free. It is not carbon free. It actually has quite a lot of carbon emissions in gross terms. Now in net terms, because of the regrowth of the forest and the carbon sequestration, et cetera, that's a different story, but that's not what the law says the targets will be, how the targets will be counted. So there's this new thinking that seems to be kind of flowing down from that law to all of us who are in this business and thinking, ooh, maybe we would be promoting people to do something that actually is going to hurt our progress towards meeting those climate targets, not help it. So we're in a little bit of a treading water phase with what to do about biomass. It's not going to stop me from using my wood stove, by the way, but, um, but we do get it that that's a tricky one. Uh, Tom Atwood asks if there is, is there any increase proposed for funding for heat pumps um, for low income? as there is similar to what is in weatherization. Uh, there's not an, in, I don't think there's an increase, but I think there is a steady, very significant funding that is available there. Is that, I see you nodding slightly, Peter. Am I mostly right about that? It's not coming it's, from the federal funds. It's fairly steady, it's fairly not steady. from the federal funds, it's coming Correct. from the settlement of the New England Clean Energy Connect, everyone's favorite transmission line. And so, uh, the settlement funds from that have been paid to us quarterly. I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but they pledged $15 million over five, uh, seven years for um, heat pump program, that, among several other programs that they agreed to fund. But we decided to use um, two thirds of that for the low income heat pump, heat pumps. And when I say low income, I mean low and moderate income. And so um, that is very well funded for the next several years, as long as those funds keep flowing. If that project is canceled because of the referendum in November and they suspend those payments, then we won't have that money any longer. But for the last year and a half we have. And um, so as far as I know right now, we're acting as if those funds will keep coming. Um, also, I, Tom, I don't know if you know this, but I, I do think that um, Maine Housing may also have some funds available, both through the uh, LIHEAP weatherization program that they've been doing. I think they've budgeted $3 million a year for heat pumps for low-income homes. Maybe they're just doing that through the CAPS. So maybe you guys, I don't know if you guys are able to participate in that, 
but it sounds to me like there may also be some more coming from federal funds. We'll see. Um, and Tom also mentions the, what I assume lots of people are experiencing that the lower income Mainers do have trouble making the, the payment for the, the cost share or the customer copay or whatever you want to call it. And um, we hear that. So we're going to look at that quite closely and we're researching right now. So I don't want to make any promises, but we are researching the possibility of um, using our newfound authority as the uh, clean energy accelerator, uh, parentheses, green bank, to provide uh, flexible financing or inc what's called inclusive financing for these lower income customers to help meet the balance of that project cost. So the rebate would maybe in that case still be $2,000, but we might be able to help them borrow the remainder. And that could be a pretty, pretty intriguing option. Um, and we think we could capitalize that with some of the funds we've been talking about. So uh, we're looking into that to see if, see if it's legal and see if we know how to, how we, we would know how to, how to do that and how we could do that equitably. Michael, I appreciate your time. Andy's, Peter's, Bridget. Christy, could you uh, mention briefly what, you're, what you guys are working on organizing right now? It's not something that we're working on organizing, Steve. That's okay. the, the, the point was just to sort of bring these questions up sure. that, that RVs might've had with the triennial plan, those that read it and then sort of representing the, the RV community as a whole. So that we Excellent. could understand what we're coming into. And no, I think the questions were all well answered and I appreciate Wonderful. the opportunity to see all your faces and, and have stuff explained. Well, we, we certainly appreciate the work being done in Maine. Uh, we appreciate the efforts, um, Christy, that you all have going on there. And then uh, Michael, Andy, Peter, Bridget, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. It's been helpful for us to uh, gain a good understanding of the projects that you're working on. And uh, we certainly look forward to working with you and uh, helping to uh, make Maine a much more efficient, um, comfortable and safe place to live. So. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, this is a recorded session and uh, you can reach out to, um, uh, you can reach out to Maine BPA for uh, details on this and uh, check us out on the website. So thanks everyone for your attendance today. Thank you, Steve. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Steve.